Good morning. It is a joy to be here at Flew Ellen Baptist Church today. Forty years ago, I believe it's this month, Merle, a young married couple moved in to the parsonage. It was right over here, and it was our first church. And Marcia and I have had a joy all these 40 years remembering and being thankful to God for such a wonderful first church. Brother Joy, we could not have had a better first church. They loved us, they, they fed us, they cared for us, and they forgave us because I made mistake after mistake. But I had a ball while I was here. And they let me be a young man as half boy, half man. And right over here used to be a basketball goal. And I used to play basketball just about every afternoon. I'd come in from school or work, and all the boys would come out, let's play, and we'd have fun. And I was just sitting there thinking and re reminiscing a while ago and being very humble and thankful. When I look around and see what all God is doing here, I lift his name because he is doing a mighty work here with his people. And I thank God for the countless number of ones that I could sit there and remember a while ago who've gone on to be with glory. And I just get excited, you know. I get to thinking about they're with Jesus and we're in Jesus and we're not that far apart. And each day we're getting closer and closer together. And what a joy. What a, what a blessing. And I thought we would do well today before we look at Jonah chapter 4 if we just spent some time before the Lord. First of all, I want to thank the Lord for those who've gone before us in this very place. The steps of faith that they took. Have brought forth great fruit. And I was sitting there and I was already thanking God about those who are yet to come here. Because I see brighter days for Flew Ellen. And the people that you're going to touch and you're going to reach, and you're going to win to Jesus. And I was thanking the Lord for so many faces that I have no idea who you are. But I was thanking God for you and the impact that you're making. So let's just, let's just bow, okay? Heavenly Father, we, we humble ourselves in, in this place and before you because, Lord, you are an awesome God. Back in the 1930s, you saw this church as being needed here. You planted this church here. And Lord, it has really grown. Thank you for those who labored in the past. Thank you for those who prayed in the past. Thank you for those who gave of themselves sacrificially in the past. Thank you for the life that they lived and the way they touched us. Thank you for the people who are here now. Thank you for the love that is here. Thank you for the sweet fellowship. Thank you for the openness. Thank you, Lord, for the way you are empowering your people and you're blessing your people. Thank you, Lord, for what lies ahead. Thank you for those who are going to be coming. Lord, thank you for blessings. Thank you for loving us. And bless us as we're in your word today, Lord. Holy Spirit, move and speak to all of us. Oh, just take the meditations of my heart, Lord, and use them for your glory. Put the words in my mouth that would exalt you. And bless us as we have table fellowship a little bit later. And share your love with each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jonah's one of those very interesting characters in the Bible. 
You remember it's a well of a story, don't you? But when you stop and you, and you think about it and you go back and you read it, you find out not only is it about a great fish story, and not only is it about a grouchy prophet. You ever seen a grouchy preacher? No, no hands raised. And, and he was called, you know, by God to do an amazing work of God. And, and when you read the account of this reluctant prophet, this prophet that didn't want to do what God wanted him to do, and yet God worked through him in such a way that it was truly one of the most remarkable events in the Scripture. One of the greatest outpourings of God's grace and mercy on a group of people that didn't deserve it and didn't want it, but desperately needed it. And you find that, that, that here's a man who goes to a place that he thought was no way God could be there, and God showed up and God showed out, and as best as we can determine, it's somewhere between four and 600,000 people responded to the message, repented, got saved, got right with God. And you won't find another event like that in the Scriptures. But we need to go further than that. And we need to dig deeper. Let me ask you a very personal question. Are you living up to your name? You see, Jonah's name means dove. And he was anything but a dove. He was more like a dud than a dove. Are you living up to your name in Jesus? Aren't you glad today that you could say Flew Ellen Baptist Church is living up to its name in Jesus? And that's what we all must strive to do. When you go back and you study more about Jonah, you find that he comes from an area where everybody said, does anything good come from there? He comes from a little bitty village just right outside of the city of Nazareth. And you remember that when they were talking about Jesus, they said, does anything good come out of Nazareth? And so Jonah is from the area of Nazareth. And so you end up saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And you know what? Anything can become good if God is in it. And any person can be a mighty warrior for God if God is in them through His Holy Spirit. And we don't need to be writing people off. And we don't need to be limiting what God can do. He's a prophet during the reign of Jeroboam II. It's not the best of times for Israel. Because way up to the northeast, they've got an enemy that they fear dreadfully. The Assyrians. If you were to look at a map today, you would find that it's Iraq. And everybody in Israel thought nothing good could come out of Iraq. No one in, Is in Iraq is worth uh, God worrying about. No one in Iraq will ever be saved. No one in Iraq will ever make a difference. But that's not who God is. 550 miles from Israel... It's where God is saying, Jonah, I want you to go up there and talk to them people and give them a, a very simple message. You know what it was? It wasn't very elaborate. Repent or else. God is going to pour out His wrath if you don't turn to Him. And that was it in a nutshell. And they didn't sing 16 stanzas of Just As I Am after that. He just had to go up and down the street. Get right or perish. Repent or burn was the simple message. And when God told him what he wanted him to do, you know what Jonah did? You remember the story. 
He went the opposite way. He left Nazareth, and instead of going northeast, he turned, and he went southwest. And he was out trying to outrun God. He was trying to get away from the presence of God. And so he went down to Joppa, and he bought a ticket, and he got on a boat. For where? Tarshish. Where in the world was Tarshish? Tarshish was on the southern tip of Spain. And in Jonah's world, everybody thought that Tarshish was the, the end spot, the jumping off spot. You didn't go past Tarshish because the world was flat. And if you went past Tarshish, you fell off. And Here's a man that God said, I want you to go 550 miles. He gets a ticket. He goes 25. He's wanting to sail 2,500 miles away from where God wanted him to be. Have you ever tried to run away from God? What happened? You can't do it. God knows exactly where you are all the time. God knows what you're doing all the time. God knows what you're thinking all the time. God knows what you're saying all the time. Why? Because God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. Now, be careful here. We are not saying that God is in everything. We're not saying that God is in this microphone or this great big fiddle over here as the pantheists do. We're saying that God is beyond that, yet God knows everything about it. So here he is. He, he get board ship. You remember there was a mighty storm? You remember everybody on the boat went around asking, what'd you do? What'd you do wrong? Are you the reason for this? All the while, Jonah is down in the bottom of the boat asleep. And they happen to remember, well, we got a passenger. Let's go ask him. And they bring him up. And you remember, they end up casting lots to see who it was. And God directed the choosing of the lots to indicate it was Jonah. And so they confronted him and said, it's you, right? Yep. And you know what he does next? You boys throw me overboard. You'll be saved if I'm tossed out. And sure enough, as soon as he hit the water, the storm stopped. The perfect storm stopped instantaneously. And then you remember what happened. He's, he's going down in the water, and God appoints a fish. That's what it literally says in the Hebrew. It doesn't say whale. It just says God appointed a fish to swallow him and to keep him for three days. And, and I'm one of those weird people. I get to thinking about that. You know, there must have been a large air cavity in that fish. What did he drink? They're in salt water. What did he, I get to thinking about all those things, and finally I just have to realize God made the fish just like God made Jonah, and God can take care of a Jonah just like he can take care of you, just like he can take care of me. And you remember, Jonah cries out and says, uh, okay, Lord, I was wrong. I'll go. And you remember, God made the fish sick and had him vomited, had Jonah vomited right where he had jumped on board of the ship and he sent him on his way to Nineveh. And you remember the king and all the king's men and all the king's people heard the message and believed. The, the, the idiom that is there is that 120,000 didn't know their left hand from their right hand, and that's basically an idiom that refers to children who are young enough to not yet know what they need to know. So if you extrapolate that, that there's 120,000 children, and you begin to process that out, you end up with somewhere between 400 and 600,000 people in this city. We are told that the inner wall of the city was eight miles long, and we're told that the circumference of the city 
was 60 miles, and it would take three days to walk around that city. Now, I've said all that to get to what I want to say, because we've got to eat, right? Do not get wrapped up in Jonah. Do not get wrapped up in the fish. Do not get wrapped up in the Ninevites. You see, the, the real point of the story of Jonah is to tell us who God is and what God is like. And if we truly understand the book of Jonah, we will come to realize the, the God of Jonah. We will know that Jonah's God is who needs to be our God. Because you see, the question right now in our culture is who is God? In fact, our culture says the answer is this. Any God will do. If that God works for you, great. Don't talk to me about it. Don't tell me about it. Don't show anything about it. Leave me alone because I'm going to find the God who works for me. That's where we are, folks. And that's who all these people out here are. And they're all thinking, I can make a God of my own making or I can choose somebody else's God, but I'll find God my way and I'll make God who I want Him to be. And that, my friends, is a lie. God is God and we're not. God will always be God, period. So I want us to sink in here and, and try to identify some things very quickly. The first thing I want you to see about this God that we see in Jonah, and I praise God for this because, man, do I need this truth. God is a God of universal love. Now let's talk about that for a moment. Did God love the Ninevites? This means yes. Did God love the Israelites? We're catching on. There's now seven people nodding. Does God love the Americans? Does God love the Chinese? Does God love the Iranians? Yes. Aren't you glad that God loves you? Would you look at your neighbor and tell them right now, look to the person to the left and say, God loves you. Now look to the person to the right and say, Amen. Amen. We got a bunch of people who don't think they're lovable. We got a bunch of people who don't think they're worthy of love. We got a bunch of people who are hurting and thinking life is over. We need to be telling them God loves them and cares about them. Who did Jesus live and die for? Me, you, them. Nowhere can I justify in the Scriptures that you and I would say that we ought to believe in an exclusive God who only loves people like us. We don't have an American God. We have a holy God. And we have a loving God. And we have a, 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 a precious, caring God for all of us. That's the first thing I want to nail down. God loves you. God loves me. God loves everybody. Doesn't like what we do. But he loves us. In that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son, Jesus, for all of us. Here's the second truth. The God of Jonah and the God who loves us is the God who's in charge. He is a sovereign God. 
He is a high and holy God. Does, is God ever taken by surprise? No. Does God, don't buy into this theology. Brother Joy would tell you about 20 years ago, we had a theology that came from the West Coast, and it's gained and it's grown, but it's still wrong who tell us that God doesn't know what he's going to do until he sees what we're going to do first. God knows what we're going to do before we even know what we're going to do. The spinoff from that is, is that God has to wait and see how things are shaped and formed before he decides to act. I want you to know he decides to act long before we ever got on the scene. I don't know how you read that phrase in the scripture, before the foundations of the earth. That tells me that God knew about Brother Joy before Brother Joy was ever conceived in his mother's womb. And God knew he was going to be pastor of Flew Ellen Baptist Church before you ever knew how to say your first name. Right? You see, when I, I don't understand all of the sovereignty of God, but this much I do know. God always knows what He's doing, and God always does the right thing, and God is always on time. Now, I struggle with that. Don't you? You see, I just finished 13 years at Southern Heights Baptist Church as their pastor, and I'm waiting on God to give me another assignment. And I'm saying, Lord, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt me at all if you showed up early. But I have to learn to wait. Why? Because as our dear brother in Atlanta, Charles Stanley, reminds us over and over and over again, God not only knows what he's doing, but God always does what is best. God never does second best. Third truth that we need to nail down. And this is one we don't want, we don't like, but it's still true. God will chastise us, God will discipline, God will teach us, God will disciple us when we're wrong. Anybody here ever blown it? You know what I'm talking about. Now, one of the true marks that you belong to God, that you're a child of his, is that he won't let you get away with it. Now, if you can do wrong and get away with it, then you really ought to be questioning, do you really have a relationship with him? It hurts, doesn't it? I mean, it hurts not only just to do wrong, but it hurts to be corrected, doesn't it? It hurts to admit that you did wrong. It hurts. But what do you do when you do wrong? Get up and say, well, I won't do that again? Yes, you will. If you get up without turning to Jesus and running to him, you'll do it again. When you do wrong, you have to come before him. You have to lay it out. You have to confess it. And you have to return from it. And that's the thing that Jonah misses. He didn't really repent. You say, well, yes, he did. He went and preached. Well, yeah, but look at chapter 4 because we're about to get to the best part of this. But it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry and he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I, that's the reason I went to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, Lord, please take my life from me because I'm better off dead than I am alive. You would think, having been saved by a fish, having been delivered from the bottom of the sea, having been 
provided for as he went to Nineveh, having been used of God in such a miraculous way that this man knew what it was to be right with God. But guess what happens? The people respond. They don't respond to him, they respond to God. And listen, that's the thing we always must remember. People need to respond to Jesus. Okay? Can you imagine? I mean, I can't. You see four, six hundred thousand people come to the Lord, turn to Him, and get right, and not be happy? What does He do? He goes out. He goes outside the city. He sits down. He is sulking. He is pouting. He is fussing. He is arguing. He is complaining with God. Don't you ever complain about God blessing somebody else. You give praise. You give thanks. You exalt His name. And here he is, sitting under this stupid bush. And well, it's, it's not stupid, God made the bush. Okay? Here he is, he's sitting and he's sulking and he's saying, oh, I told you that would happen. I told you if I went there and told them about you, they'd believe in you, they'd turn to you. I told you they, they didn't deserve it. I told you you ought to just wipe them out. Who does Jonah think he is? How dare he say, Lord, I told you so. Now, you ready for the big truth? Got a little girl over here said, yeah, I'm hungry. Are you ready for the big truth? God was as eager to save the Ninevites as he was eager to save Jonah. God is eager to save you. God is eager to bless you. God is eager to anoint you. God is eager to fill you and empower you. God is eager for you to serve in his kingdom. God is eager for you to be a minister of his grace. God is eager for you to show God's mercy to others. If we ever needed the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is now. Because I just finished reading the Kentucky Baptist Convention asked me to read some books and things and, and to respond. And one of the books I just read was talking about the great evangelical depression. How many of you would, well, what would you say if I was to ask you, how many people in America do you think really believe in Jesus Christ, have trusted Jesus as their Savior, and live for Jesus in their daily living? You know what we've been saying to ourselves for the last 30 years? Between 49 and 52%. Did you know that's a lie? When we talk about people really knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, serving Jesus, walking with Jesus, and living for Jesus, the number comes down to 9%. Let me break it down for you. Up and down Flew Ellen Road, if that was like any street in America, you can answer the question if it is. I happen to think it's better. But if it was just like any street in America, only one out of ten people would know Jesus as Savior, live for Jesus as He is Lord, and bring glory to His name. Yet God loves those nine as much as He loved that one. And God wants that, those nine to be saved as much as He desired for, those, for that one to be saved. Where should our passion be?
It should be with Jesus. We should have his heart, shouldn't we? Now we come to the moment of decision, and it's very, very important. Because you see, I think homecoming is more than just eating food and seeing each other and so forth. I think it means we need to come closer to the Lord. Don't you? Brother Joy, can we use this as an altar here? Praise the Lord. I want to ask you something. Do you need to be just one inch closer to Jesus than you were when you came in here? I want to challenge you. Did you know that in his heart, he desires it more than you could ever dream of? When we sing in just a moment, I want to ask you, those of you who are in Christ, those of you who are followers, I want to ask you to set the example. I'm going to ask you to come forward and say, Lord, I want to move closer. Draw me, Jesus. And I want to say to anyone else who's not in Jesus today, when you see those coming and moving closer to Jesus, you need to do the same thing. I'm going to ask you to come and take Brother Joy by the hand and say, Brother Joy, I'm ready for Jesus. I'm ready for Jesus in my life. I know there's something missing. I need, I need it. I need an answer. I need Jesus. I'm going to ask all of us, will any God do? No. I'm going to ask you to come take your pastor by the hand and say, I want you to know, Pastor, I love the Lord our God. He is holy and just. He is righteous and true. And Pastor, I take my stand with you. We will love the Lord our God with all our hearts. And we will love each other more than we love ourselves. And we will take our stand and live for Jesus. Brother, would you come and lead us? Would you stand right now all over this place? Would you just stand? Now I want you to think about who you're standing before. Not me. Not Brother Joy. Not the guys up here. You're standing before the living Lord. Can you feel his presence? He's here. He's here. And he loves you. And he desires to bring into you all of his will, the fulfillment of his purpose. Do you desire to glorify him? I pray that you will. Father, bless us now as we come to this moment. Holy Spirit, move upon us. We don't want to do anything what the Spirit leads us to do. But Lord, what your Spirit leads us to do, give us faith, give us determination, give us the ease to do it. And Lord, we would not be ashamed of you and we would not be ashamed of the gospel, but that we would take our stand right now for your name and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.